Good morning. It's a lively crowd here this morning. The day after the holiday, I hope everybody had a terrific holiday weekend. And um, first, would like to welcome you on behalf of Gallup to the Great Hall. Uh, my name is Brandon Busteed, Executive Director of Gallup Education, and uh, am delighted to be sharing with you uh, what effectively is a um, a derivative uh, report on the overall national Gallup Purdue index study that we announced uh, the national findings of a few weeks ago. And um, thanks to a very large data set of more than 30,000 college graduates that we collected from that national study, there are all sorts of additional analyses that Gallup uh, and various partners are going to have an opportunity to dig into, one of which uh, comes from looking at uh, those who had experiences in fraternities and sororities as college students and looking at the long-term outcomes relative to their work engagement and well-being as a result. So what I'm going to do is uh, briefly present the overall findings and we'll spend a few minutes reviewing the highlights of the national study just to give everybody some context of what we're going to compare the, the uh, graduates who had fraternity and sorority experiences against, which is all other college graduates from the study. So after I present the results, we're going to ask uh, for a couple commentary from folks that I'll introduce uh, in, a, in a few minutes here, and then followed by a panel where we'll have plenty of time for Q&A. So that's the plan for this morning. Um, so first, let's just cover a little bit about what this study was. So the Gallup-Purdue Index is a national study of more than 30,000 college graduates. Gallup presented the findings from this at a very high level a few weeks ago. And uh, within that study, we had a little over 5,000 of the total respondents who had been members of fraternities or sororities when they were in college. So what we're doing here in this report is comparing those 5,000 plus graduates who were members of fraternities and sororities to the overall national data set of college graduates. Gallup recruited this study through our typical random digit dial methodology, which is how we do our daily polling. So on any given day uh, across the um, year, Gallup is recruiting folks from across the country. Everybody has an equal probability of being contacted. We use a 50-50 cell phone landline mix in that process. And when we found people who uh, said that they had their highest educational attainment was a minimum of a bachelor's degree or higher, we invited them into the Gallup-Purdue index study. This was a web-based study. So one point of uh, kind of clarification about the sample is that this is a representative sample of college graduates in the US who have internet access. Now, just to give you an idea of why we're so comfortable reporting these results, uh, as essentially representative is that 90% of all college graduates in the U.S. have internet access. And that is compared to 97% of Americans who have telephone access. So we feel very good about the strength of the methodology and the sampling used in this report. And so that uh, is what we're going to be showing you today. Just uh, to be clear, in the national study, uh, the margin of error was a little different than this because we're reporting on obviously a smaller subset of those who are members of fraternities and sororities. And so you'll notice that the overall margin of error here is 2%. Uh, on the general findings and 2.7% on the workplace engagement findings in this particular subset. So with those uh, introductory caveats in place, let me tell you about the two key outcomes that we were most interested in measuring. And it's the degree to which these graduates are engaged in their work and thriving in their well-being, two dimensions that Gallup has studied more than any other organization uh, and has done so now for decades. So we have simply paraphrased those two dimensions as measuring the degree to which these graduates have great jobs and great lives. Well-being, as we defined it, is something that um, covers five key elements. And they're described here in very simple ways. And I won't go into great depth of the explanation because the definitions are fairly self-explanatory. But in Gallup's research on well-being, these five elements come to the top in all the analysis as things that are linked to a number of key performance indicators that we all care a lot about. So well-being sounds like a wonderful thing to measure, a nice thing to measure. It turns out it's also a very hard measure in terms of how it relates to predicting key performance indicators that I'll show you in just a second here. So as it relates to something that all of us are concerned about, health care cost burden, 
um, this is something that has a very real impact. So if you have an employee who's thriving in all five elements of well-being, according to Gallup's measures, they have one-third of the health care cost burden than someone who's not thriving in any. And you don't have to get an employee thriving in all five elements in order to make an impact. As you can see here, that if there is somebody thriving in one element, two, three, or four, the incremental cost uh, to the health care uh, goes down accordingly. So well-being is not just a nice to have, it's a need to have. And the same thing goes with how we measure great jobs or workplace engagement. So Gallup has now surveyed more than 27 million people in over 140 countries on their workplace engagement. It's arguably the largest study of human beings that's ever been conducted if you aggregate that over time. And we know a lot about what matters in terms of engagement in the workplace and how that's connected to key performance indicators for organizations. And the 12 items that we have boiled down to workplace engagement measures, some of them you'll see are, are kind of funny items, right? The degree to which you feel you have someone who cares about your development is a really important one for all of us in our jobs. Being able to say that you do what you're best at every day is a pretty important one. And you can get a sense of those that are listed here. But here's the point. They matter when it comes to metrics that organizations care about. So whether we're talking about productivity, absenteeism, turnover, or in businesses, things like revenue and profit, engaged people and engaged workplaces do better on those measures. So why do organizations care about workplace engagement? Yes, it's a nice to have, it sounds lovely, but it's also a need to have in terms of their organizational performance. So in this study, Gallup measured these two dimensions. Here briefly are the overall findings from the national study. Some of the fascinating things we found is that it, it matters very little or not at all where you go by type of institution. So there was no difference in the likelihood of graduates being engaged in their work or thriving their well-being between public and private institutions. That's a rather broad distinction, but still an interesting finding right out of the gates. There was no difference when we cut it further and looked at selective institutions, according to Carnegie classification, selective institutions. We also looked at familiar benchmarks that many of us use, top 100 ranked schools in US News and World Report, for example, no difference between graduates of those institutions and all others on the likelihood of being engaged or thriving. Now, we did find some differences, and they were more importantly how you did college or how you experienced college. And so one of the first really important nuggets that we learned was that if you were emotionally supported as a college student, which was described by these three items we have listed here, you said you strongly agreed to having at least one professor who made you excited about learning. You felt that the professors at your alma mater cared about you as a person. These funny words like care start to, they just keep creeping into the research every time Gallup digs into this. Um, and that you uh, had a mentor who encouraged your hopes and dreams. If you said strongly agree to all three of those, it doubled your odds of being engaged in work and you were three times as likely to be thriving in your well-being. These things matter a lot. Interestingly enough, we also found three other items that were also important to workplace engagement, that if you had deep learning or experiential elements in your college experience, they also doubled your odds of being engaged in work and had a slight boost to overall well-being. These were items that included saying that you worked on a long-term project that took a semester or more to complete, that you had a job or an internship where you applied what you were learning, and that you were extremely involved in extracurricular activities and organizations. Now, I, I just want to point out something here, very simply, because we asked in this study a whole series of questions about things you were involved in, right? Were you a member of a, an athletic organization, right? NCAA Division I, II, or three athlete. A whole list of various involvements, which included being a member of a fraternity and sorority. But we use this as a distinguishing item or element and also asking not just were you involved in this long checklist of various activities, but a statement about your belief. You strongly agreed that you were extremely involved in extracurricular activities and organizations. And I want to come back to this because this is one element where fraternity and sorority members really differentiate themselves. 
So here are the findings on those who are members of fraternities and sororities. 43% are engaged in their work. This compares to those who did not have a fraternity or sorority experience at 38% engaged in work. And so those who are members of fraternities and sororities are more likely to be engaged in their jobs. Across well-being, the majority of those who are fraternity or sorority members are thriving in at least one element of well-being, purpose being the most important one where 59% are thriving. And I'll show you on the next slide how this compares to college graduates writ large. Here's the interesting thing. What we learned in both categories is that we all still have plenty of work to do when it comes to graduates thriving in all five dimensions of their well-being, which is a gold standard. It's not an easy one to get there, but we should still be shooting for it nonetheless. We found that only 12% of those who are fraternity and sorority members are thriving in all five dimensions of well-being, and more than one in eight aren't thriving in any. Now, in the national study, we reported that one in six college graduates weren't thriving in any dimension of well-being. So obviously those who had a fraternity or sorority experience are slightly more likely uh, to not be thriving in, in a, a, at least one dimension. But this is a very interesting point, obviously, because we all still have plenty of work to do as it relates to the intentional emphasis of well-being in the college experience. And we have a lot of opportunities, I think, where we can shape that. But if we look at those who had a fraternity and sorority experience compared to those who did not, on each of these measures of well-being, they're slightly higher. When we control for gender, race and ethnicity, and socioeconomic status, these are significant findings. So those are important things for us to know and understand about this experience. Nationally, we reported that graduates who were emotionally supported are six times as likely to be emotionally attached to their alma mater. You know, this is an interesting thing. So Gallup has done a lot of work measuring customer engagement for a lot of the world's greatest brands. And in that research, although it doesn't perfectly apply to how you think about evaluating your alma mater, we thought that there were a couple questions that were just brilliantly applicable here. And they were that this was the perfect place for people like me. If you say that about your brand or an experience you had at a hotel or whatever that is, that's a strong predictor of the likelihood that you stay more nights in that hotel property, buy more of that product, talk more about it in very positive ways to friends and family, et cetera. And then the other question we asked uh, about the alma mater was that you couldn't imagine a world without it. So I can't imagine a world without Duke University. If you said strongly agree to those two items, that's what we measured as alumni attachment. So those are very strong statements, right? And they come from well-known research that we've done in the customer engagement world, and we're interested in applying it through the lens of alma maters. We found that nationally college graduates who had the deep and experiential learning experiences were twice as likely to be emotionally attached as alums. And so we know that having more of those experiences are linked to this idea that you can't imagine a world without your alma mater. So it's kind of not surprising. It's something that, that we have believed, I think, in the, um, in the world of higher ed that fraternity and sorority members are more likely to be engaged uh, alumni but um, other than maybe perhaps looking at some giving rates and certain things like that, we haven't had other ways to quantify it. And so what we found in this study is that those who had a fraternity or sorority experience are more likely to be attached, emotionally attached alums. So a lot of this is linked to some of the key elements that we discovered in the national study. We know that these elements matter a lot to your college experience. And so looking at how the experience of Greek organizations is different, those who are members of fraternity and sorority are higher on each of these dimensions, most notably so on having a mentor who encouraged their hopes and dreams. So when we control for the elements I described earlier, this, this particular finding stands above the rest. Um, and so if you just think about this, uh, the elements of fraternity or sorority that uh, are intentional in driving some of these outcomes is, is what I will have our panel and uh, other folks comment on later today. But then it, these, are, these are the items individually. If you look at all three of these together, so graduates who said strongly agree to all three, 
it's an interesting difference between fraternity and sorority and not. 16% of fraternity and sorority uh, members strongly agreed all three versus 13% of college graduates nationally. And when it comes to providing experiential and deep learning experiences, not any difference on working on a long-term project, a, a little difference on having an internship or a job where you apply what you're learning, um, and a, a very significant difference on saying you're extremely involved. Now here's the point that I brought up earlier. This is not just about fraternities and sororities because we asked other college graduates the various things they were involved in, right? Something about fraternity and sorority makes you much more likely to say you were extremely involved in extracurricular activities and organizations, and so it's not surprising to see a fairly not notable difference here in the percent who strongly ag agree to all three. 11% of fraternity and sorority graduates strongly agree to all three versus 5% of the general uh, college graduate population. And then finally, just some additional key results that we thought were interesting. Um, college uh, fraternity and sorority grads are less likely to have taken out student loans for their education. And that is most um, uh, probably linked to the likelihood of starting a business as well. So from the national study, we reported that those who had more student loans were less likely to start businesses. So obviously these are kind of linked findings, but nonetheless interesting to know that fraternity and sorority members are more likely to start businesses, more likely to graduate debt-free than others, uh, and a substantial difference in feeling that their college prepared them for life after. So with that, I'm going to conclude my remarks and invite uh, Gene Morosik, chairman of the National Panhellenic Council, to um, come up and deliver some commentary on what uh, she thinks about these findings. So, Jean, thank you. Thank you, Brandon, and good morning. Thank you to Gallup for hosting this event and allowing MPC the opportunity to participate. As MPC chairman, I speak for thousands of sorority women today, both collegians and alumni, and we are pleased to collaborate with Gallup and our counterpart at the North American Interfraternity Conference, NIC, in the research and the findings associated with the index study. As the umbrella organization for the 26 member organizations, MPC advocates for the sorority experience. Women nurturing women is nothing new for us. Some of our organizations are more than 150 years old. We know that we provide supportive social learning environments for our students. This is part of our heritage. It is with a great sense of accomplishment that we can point to specific high-level data that supports the notion that sorority membership enhances the college experience and provides lifelong support networks for our members. The results of this study are indeed powerful in that they validate what we advocate on a regular basis and what we know to be true that sororities contribute to the overall well-being of women. With the help of this research and its results, we hope to help eliminate any negative barriers about sorority life in, in the today's world. When we decided to participate in this research, we knew that the results could tell us things that would be helpful. While the indicators in all five areas point in favor of the fraternity and sorority experience as contributing to well-being, it also tells us that we can strive to better our best. We can and will do more to build on these strengths. Previous research conducted by the Center for the Advanced Social Research at the University of Missouri-Columbia revealed that members of fraternities and sororities accounted for the social capital found in communities. The Gallup research findings disclosed today further reinforces our claim that sororities and fraternities add value. Sorority women are finding fulfillment in their postgraduate years because of lessons learned and experiences that help shape their attitudes while in college.
Strong relationships formed with professors and other mentors are encouraged in sorority chapters. Access to resources that people need is found in our sorority settings. Alumni chapter advisors and local alumni volunteers help to guide our young leaders and empower them to make good decisions. They offer emotional support to young women in pursuit of their dreams. And we know that the intergenerational aspect associated with the sorority experience is our niche. Our alumni care deeply about their organizations and this motivates them to give back as mentors. Evidence shows that face-to-face -face interactions matter and make a tremendous difference in the lives of our graduates related to future engagement at work and in their communities. Graduates want to take part in a true community. We believe that our chapters offer authentic communities where people genuinely care about one another. The index study findings reinforce the fact that this sense of belonging contributes to the overall well-being of graduates and continues throughout their lifetimes. We know too that sorority women have a higher emotional attachment to their alma mater. This translates into alumni engagement and involvement that benefits the universities in numerous ways, including financial support. Working in concert with university officials, we are in the business of student development whereby we encourage engagement in campus activities and scholastic achievement. Therefore, it is reaffirming to see that what we are doing is working and that is to develop future leaders who find fulfillment in their daily work and interactions. In short, the shared commitment among members in the National Panhellenic Conference allows us to operate as a unified coalition of women. The Gallup Index Study findings shared today are an extension of our organization's mission to encourage sorority affiliation as a lifelong commitment that helps flourish friendship, responsibility, community engagement, and confidence. We will continue to tell our story now with data to back up our claims that the sorority experience indeed contributes to the overall well-being of women. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, Jean. And before I introduce uh, Pete Smithheiser, just uh, a couple of comments. The, some of you may be well aware of um, how Gallup conducts studies. And I just wanted to make a note of this because I think it's a very important point. In the work we're doing for the Gallup Purdue Index and in work that will follow with partners like Purdue who are now going to measure their own alumni against that national index, as we do these studies, if these studies are intended for public release, Gallup has very strict rules around how that research is conducted and how the results are disseminated. And regardless of good, bad, or indifferent findings, if it was intended for public release, all of those results are released. So this is both the risk and the opportunity of conducting a study for public release through Gallup is that it's all out there, full disclosure. And so in the case of Purdue, an institution that plans to release all of their results on their alumni, good, bad, or indifferent, those results are going to go out. And their focus is on getting better. And so I appreciated Gene's comments about that in that this is the real opportunity that we've created through this national study is for organizations like NPC and NIC to know how they're doing, to want to be able to understand that in a very real way and regardless of good, bad, or indifferent findings, to continually improve. Obviously, there are some great results that have been uh, found relative to fraternity and sorority experience, but I just wanted to make note of that because I appreciate the leadership that NPC and NIC has shown in wanting to understand uh, the long-term outcome of their uh, members and to know what they can do to continue to improve on that. So with that, let me introduce Pete Smithheiser, President and CEO of the National Interfraternity Conference.
Good morning, everyone. As introduced, I'm Pete Smith Heisler. I have the privilege and honor of serving as the President and CEO of the North American Interfraternity Conference. The NIC is the trade association that represents 74 international and national men's fraternities. That translates into approximately 400,000 undergraduates on 800 campuses across the United States and Canada. And it also includes nearly 5 million alumni members. The mission of the NIC is to grow and advance this thing that we know and love called fraternity. We do that through advocacy, collaboration, and education. We do that by ensuring that the fraternity experience that we describe to potential joiners is the one that they actually experience. The values of fraternities, creating communities within the higher education that they are experiencing, and growing the opportunity to develop skills is part of the mission of fraternity. You have often heard me say that when fraternity is done right, it is the premier leadership experience on college campuses today. I further say that fraternities have never been more relevant to a generation of college students than we are today because of the expectations that we create, the values integration that is part of their experience, and ultimately the well-rounded individual that we send out into the world. What grabbed me via the results of this study is that when I say that joining a fraternity will likely make you a better person, perhaps a better doctor, a better engineer, a better teacher, a better community advocate, these results say to me that with a good fraternity experience, we are creating better citizens, better advocates for those next in line to experience the fraternity. I also believe that the co-curricular experience matters. That it's not just about learning in a classroom. It's about applying what we learn in the classroom and having the opportunity to truly experience what leadership is. We often talk about the 21st century skills that fraternity provides, whether that's the opportunity for values clarification, the skills and passion learned by working with a diverse membership, the opportunity to try something out. That's what happens in the living learning laboratory called a fraternity. We have the opportunity to develop and hone skills. We have the opportunity to collaborate with individuals whose background may be different than ours. We have the opportunity to impact the collegiate experience by our leadership. And that's what I think the results tell us today that I take my undergraduate experience and I apply it to the rest of my life, whether that's in the formation of relationships, whether that's in my workplace engagement, or whether that's my impact in the communities in which I live. These skills that we learn as undergraduates really are lifelong skills. When I think about the stories that those who have come before me tell, they often include something related to my mentor taught me or an alumnus shared this experience with me or a door was opened because of a relationship that I have. That intergenerational play that exists within the fraternity experience, undergraduates with various generations of alumni have the opportunity to learn and grow because of the mentoring relationship that is inherent in the fraternity experience. It is incumbent upon the fraternities to, to ensure that the alumni engagement within the undergraduate and lifelong experience is real and directed. Many of our resources are directed at the undergraduate experience. Seems appropriate in that good training will result in good efforts later. But I think that we could benefit by providing direct resource, providing resources and direct engagement with our alumni in order to ensure that they have purposeful connection to the fraternity experience. 
part of what's important for us as the leadership within fraternities and sororities is to ensure that student safety, student engagement, and student success are at the forefront of our work. It is no secret that there are issues within higher education related to alcohol, our students' alcohol use, and perhaps misuse. The idea that our student organization experiences should be hazing free, regardless of if it's fraternity, sorority, athletics, music, honor organizations. Hazing has no place in these experiences. And finally, all of our students should be safe, especially as it relates to sexual violence. So 45 days ago, I announced to the leadership of the North American Interfraternity Conference the formation of three commissions to look at, to research, and to provide recommendations to the NIC about how fraternities can become leaders within higher education related to the issues of alcohol use, hazing prevention, and sexual violence prevention. It is important that these commissions understand that their bold leadership will impact the future of fraternities. Via these recommendations, we will have the opportunity to directly address these three issues which can negatively impact any student experience. If we do this right, then we as a clear microcosm of the higher education community, fraternities and sororities can provide the direct link of how we can do better, how we can ensure that our students are graduating, how we can ensure that the student experience is positive for all. I am proud of the NIC for taking this leadership role, and I know that it will directly impact what fraternity looks like in the future. I have said to the commission chairman that the only agenda that I bring is that staying the same is not an option. We must advance this thing that we know and love called fraternity. And together, with this research, with a lot of passion from our members, we will ensure a positive future for this experience. I really want to thank you all for being here today and being an active participant in this discussion, for I know it is through our collective work that good things will happen. Brandon? I'd like to go ahead and invite uh, Pete and Gene and also Kevin Kruger to uh, join us as uh, panelists here. And uh, by way of introduction, uh, Kevin Kruger is the president of NASPA, the National Association of Student Personnel Administrators. And uh, we're delighted to have you here as well, Kevin. So thanks very much. So um, I have a one question interview as the moderator of this panel, which means that you all have just a few minutes to formulate what questions you uh, might have for our panelists. So um, I'll just start with a simple one. And Kevin, I'd love to, to have you lead off since Gene and Pete have made a couple comments about this. But um, uh, what do you think of these findings? Am I on? I'm on. You're on. Uh, first of all, thanks, thanks for having me here. It's nice to be here. I guess the first word I'd say is hallelujah. Um, I, uh, I spent a lot of time in my uh, job thinking about higher education and where we're going. And a lot of the conversation about higher education sometimes centers around what we're not doing right um, and, uh, or how expensive it is and why it's so expensive. And you think about books like Richard Aram's Academically Adrift, who talked about the fact that students didn't learn anything. Um, and then you have a lot of work, uh, a lot of writing this week, this year, about from the Delta Cost Project about why college is so expensive. Well, it's because us administrators have jacked up the cost of higher education. I can come back to that issue later if you're interested. Um, even Jeff Salingo, and I don't know if the Chronicle's here, but uh, Jeff Salingo, who's uh, been on the speaker's circuit, who wrote College Unbound, um, which is excellent, um, but characterizes the work that we do with students as essentially coddling and depriving, depriving them of their normally developmental experiences by all this administrative staff that we put on it. So, so when I say hallelujah, I mean it, it's nice to see um, some recognition of something that we know in our hearts. Um, and what we know in our hearts is that the college experience matters. It matters when you're involved. It matters when you um, participate in activities. We know it matters in Greek life. Uh, and, and we know this because we don't, we, it's great to see it confirmed uh, and affirmed by this research, but we know it because when we talk to people, our friends, our neighbors, our colleagues, and we ask them about the college experience, it's almost universal. They talk about, what do they talk about? 
They talk about the activities they were involved in, the fraternity they belonged to, the sorority they were involved in, the, the events, the leadership experiences. They, they talk about those as being the most, the things that make the most difference in, in their, their success and their job and their community. Um, uh, they don't usually talk about the physics class. Um, <laughs> and it's not to say that the academics don't matter. It's just that it's part of the whole, the whole experience is what matters. And I think that this research kind of points that out. So I say hallelujah. It's nice to see that there's um, some evidence that uh, beginning to, sh uh, to come, come to light that talks about the power of some of these uh, co-curricular and extracurricular activities that we know have a huge impact on student success um, and on creating citizens, as, as Pete said. So uh, thanks for sharing that. That's great. Jean, what, uh, what would you add beyond your uh, introductory remarks? Well, it is uh, refreshing, again, to see the results. Um, back up our claims. Uh, we can't just say that we add value. This actually puts proof in the pudding. And I know those of us that have been alumni advisors um, have watched our young women evolve during the course of their college experience, um, can see how this uh, truly uh, reinforces what we know to be true, is that these relationships matter. Um, they, they make a tremendous difference. Um, we hold hands, we um, are there as a sounding board when somebody gets a job offer and they're trying to make a decision. We're there um, for a shoulder to cry on when they're experiencing things they've never experienced before. Um, these type of uh, relationships truly, truly uh, add value and um, in many ways as we see the uh, emotional uh, support that is so critical uh, to the college experience, um, we can see now how that um, translates in, and corresponds with the workplace engagement. People appreciate identity. Um, and we, we know how to do that at the, at the college level, in our sorority chapters, in our fraternity chapters. There, suffice to say, I think we provide a training ground for the teams and the teamwork that takes place, um, and this spills over into what they experience later in the workplace. That's great. Pete, what would, uh, what would you add? As I was reflecting on the results, one thing I kept coming back to is we now have an answer for every potential joiner and for his parents or her parents, why should I join a fraternity or sorority? The answer is because it makes you better. Via the workplace engagement, via the factors of well-being, we know that the fraternity experience is going to teach you and prepare you for life after college. We have had stories and anecdotal evidence that that has been true, and for generations we have said, when you graduate, all of these learning experiences will impact your work, will impact your relationships, will impact how you are involved in your communities. And this, these results, I think, show that. And it is a message to all of us that co-curricular experience does matter. I understand that the fraternity sorority experience isn't for everyone, but what this, these results tell me is that we need to work in partnership with higher education to ensure that all students have some type of engagement so that they can practice their leadership experiences, their leadership skills, that they can be connected to someone. And what I think fraternities and sororities do well is that mentoring relationship. It's built into the entire experience. From the new member experience where you are given an older brother to be your mentor, your guide, the, the person who will show the way, to the graduate experience via our alumni advisors, our committee work, and just the opportunity to move to a new city and have a built-in network of professional connections. These are the things that excite me, and these are the things that, when I say I believe in fraternity, this is what I'm talking about, and this is what gives me excitement and passion to continue our work. And I acknowledge all the issues that we have to work on, but 
I know that those things are not insurmountable. With directed effort, we can address those issues to ensure that the experience just gains momentum and creates even a better experience and a better outcome for our alumni members. Thanks very much. I'll uh, ask the audience. I, I've got some other questions I can throw at them, but I would like to uh, know if anybody would like to uh, ask some questions. Any, uh, any show of hands at this point? You can keep thinking on it. Yes. We have a, we'll, we'll bring the microphone around to you. It might just be helpful to talk into it since we're recording some things, if you don't mind. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lauren Long. I'm from George Mason University. And um, I hear you talk a little, you just mentioned how we need, you need to work with higher education institutions so that we continue pushing the co-curricular engagement of our students. Is there anything you can speak to now that I don't know if it's just because we're grounded in what a lot of us know is already true by having these findings, but what is something that those of us that work at a higher education institution uh, in student life, what is it that you would want us to be doing that we're not doing already? Or what is it something that you're working with that you'd want us to be jumping on board with? I, I heard Pete talk about these great um, three committees that NIC is doing and immediately I started thinking about okay how do we jump on board with that how can we be a partner um, so I'm curious if there are some things that you're finding that you aren't getting by in, into or a doorway in or just anything that we can do to be good partners together I'd love to jump at that and thank you Lauren for that question two things automatically jumped into my head one is both fraternities and sororities in our leadership as well as at um, the collegiate level, you as a director of campus activity, we focus a lot of our energy, our resources, solely on the undergraduate, teaching those skills, providing experiences, creating opportunities. But I think what I learned via these results is, what if we invested the same amount of time in bringing back our alumni and involving them directly in that both educational process as well as mentoring process? We don't have to do this alone. And the more people working towards the same goal, the more opportunities we have to connect with those undergraduates and potentially positively impact their experience. With the shrinking resources that we have available, we need to tap into all of the connections um, that we have. And the second thing that I, I heard you ask about, Lauren, is how do we sustain this? Um, it seems like those of us who have been in the industry for, for many years, it, it's a cycle. And what I would like to do via the commissions and their recommendations, via this research and, and other engagement, is to change the cycle and ensure that we're not repeating these educational points and that we sustain this impact well beyond and that we continue to advance um, these opportunities. I don't want to be back here in 10 years having the same conversation. What else would you guys add? Jim well, the only thing I want to add is the ongoing dialogue with higher ed officials and with Kevin Great. being here today, I think this is this speaks volumes about the ongoing dialogue that we have with higher ed officials, university officials. Um, one of the things that we're doing in MPC is, uh, is making campus visits. We're meeting with university officials. Um, around the table, we're talking about how we can empower our women to operate as a unified coalition of women and to encourage them uh, to uh, strive not just for their personal goals, but to work together for positive outcomes. And it has been fascinating to have these conversations around the table and for them to know that our mission is their mission. Mm -hmm. we, we want uh, the greater welfare of all students. And um, I know Kevin um, uh, 
certainly here today represents um, a lot of uh, people from coast to coast with regard to the same mission um, and vision that we all have for our students and the greater welfare of our students. And I think the dialogue has to continue. Has to continue. I want to follow up on something Pete said. Uh, oh, thank you. Um, the role of alumni, I think, which I think is something that you, you all do well. Um, mm -hmm. And as uh, sort of look at what's taking place uh, nationally right now, this, the dialogue has really shifted partially because of college costs to almost a return on investment a, a, a approach for higher education. We paid this much, I want this kind of high paying job. Um, and, and I think we're, we're going to probably be, this next five, ten years, we're going to see a lot of attention paid to employability, gainful employment. You're going to see lots of more conversation about that. Um, and if you look at what stu when students reflect on their experience, the, um, you know, a couple of data points, uh, only 20% of students use the Career Center. Um, most students, their biggest regret is they didn't spend more time focusing on their career, which kind of gets at this, you know, that's not disconnected from your data set, which is really, well, while all this is good, there's still a lot of folks who are not very happy and engaged in their work, right? So there's that, that kind of disconnect. Um, we're not going to be able to hire more career counselors. We're not going to be able to hire more advisors. We're not going to be able to hire any more anybody. Um, so I think alumni are a place where we can do mm -hmm. more work with our students. Um, and I think, you know, if I'd say, you know, the place where I think we need to shift a little bit is that we need to shift um, the balance between all the involvements that students have as sort of part of that coming of age developing all that kind of discovering themselves, which is very important. But we, I think we need to be, uh, increase our emphasis on the, the notion of developing a meaningful career, mm -hmm. a purposeful life, a life of purpose. Um, and getting students to think about that earlier in their endeavors. And I think that alumni could play a role in that. And again, you guys do that very well, getting in alumni connected. I think we need to do more, more of that broadly across the institution because they're, they're a tremendous resource. And that wisdom that comes from working, I think, could really connect to the student experience in some, in some meaningful ways. And maybe we'd change that percentage. Just, I don't think we're gonna get more students to stop by the Career Center, but I think we might get more students, fewer students who say they regret not thinking about their career earlier. So that's just a thought as I think about some of that. I would think that there would be a connection there too with, um, we know from our late 90s research via the University of Missouri Columbia that fraternity and sorority alumni are better engaged with alma mater and tend to provide more resources, whether that's time or dollar. And I think that we can connect into that um, better for the future here. So can, can we take that alumni engagement and take it one step further to um, impact resources, availability, mentoring, connections? Um, and help provide role models for what these factors of well-being actually are and to show it in real life to uh, a young person as to how this impacts your um, well-being throughout your life. I, I might just add just one more thing and, and it's to your point, you know, the thought being I can be what I can see. Um, if we can link and, and provide those interactions be, uh, between successful alumni and students, um, that empowers them to, to want to strive for higher goals. And I know some institutions are really good about students that are uh, the benefactors of scholarships mm -hmm. um, or apprenticeships. They're able to match those students with those donors um, in, in a magical way where the student can actually thank the donor but also learn from that individual um, and, and hear more about their um, experiences, um, successful careers, et cetera. We do that naturally within our settings. And so um, I think too that's a broader type of uh, goal that could be uh, put out there to engage these students to see what success looks like. Good point. That's great. Anybody have a question? Yes. I'm actually going to piggyback on what you said. I, I'm sorry for missing the beginning, but I was wondering why there was an elimination of questions about philanthropy and service as it relates to the fraternity and sorority grouping, and also the connection between the dollars that 
in my own experience, NPC groups provide to their, their members for scholarship. And if there was any discussion about why that wasn't included or in future iterations talking about that. Uh, yeah, great question about the study. So, um, you know, we, we had the um, advantage and opportunity of looking at this off of a, um, a national study, right? So uh, the opportunity to look at the fraternity and sorority membership affiliation and its output is all linked to the questions we asked as part of the broader national study. So unfortunately, when you do a national study, there, there's only so many questions that you can get to. I mean, the, um, the things that we had to leave on the cutting room floor uh, are things that we hope to get to in subsequent years, are things that we certainly have opportunity for drilled on on. So we had questions that kind of broadly sorted uh, against college experiences. So, so we, we didn't ask things that were very specific to some of those questions, but they would be the perfect kind of follow-up question to start to ask around this. You know, do the additional scholarships provided by fraternities and sororities lower the uh, probability of their uh, alumni graduating with, with loans, right? I mean, we know that that's a finding, we don't know if that's way of, you know, the members they've recruited are less likely to have student loans or there's an experience that is part of it that matters. But obviously that's one notable thing that if you evaluate fraternities and sororities, uh, one of my good friends, Dwayne Weimer, who many of you know, always talks about how uh, he owes everything to his fraternity because they gave him a scholarship. Mm -hmm. And he wouldn't have had a scholarship through any other avenue. So there's certainly those stories out there. We know that's part of the process, um, but we didn't ask those questions specifically of the fraternity and sorority subset as part of it. So I think future years, those are things that we you know, may be able to drill into. Um, but certainly, you know, when we answer certain questions, we, uh, we raise a whole bunch of additional ones that um, we'd love to dig into as, as time goes on. So those are great questions, though. Thanks. And Brandon, I might add with regard to scholarships, I was, uh, had the privilege of being in Cleveland a few weeks ago. Um, the Alumni Panhellenic Organization there celebrated its 100th anniversary. And it was thrilling to have 10 collegians present who were the recipients of $2,000 scholarships each. And some of their words were, this has made a tremendous difference. Um, this is uh, an investment in my career. Um, some of the words from these students and to hear what they're doing uh, with their careers was incredible. And so the power of, um, the power of what these collective groups can do to encourage and, and um, you know, uh, just invest in these students is uh, quite incredible. The, the fraternity Hi, sorority experience also extends beyond just this type of giving. There are um, just tremendous fraternity and sorority philanthropists who are out there making a difference in communities with their alma maters, with the fraternity or sorority. It is through their generosity that we have the flexibility to do some creative and innovative leadership practices. So we thank them for that as well. And then I would express that one of the values of fraternities and sororities that we share across all 100 plus organizations is this idea of giving back to the community. And so I think it's an underreported number, but in the last year, 32 million hours of service was done within the communities in which we live by undergraduate fraternity and sorority members. But imagine if we collected the data for all the service given by our alumni members and how many PTO meetings are led by fraternity and sorority leaders, how many um, races for the cure are led by fraternity and sorority leaders, things of this nature and the impact that we have on our community and how that engagement helps our overall well-being. That's great. All right, yes. Good morning. Um, I really appreciate this conversation. It's very, very fruitful. And although I can appreciate the universality in terms of the report findings um, on the impact of college graduates, um, as a member of a, a black Greek letter organization, um, I was just curious to know in terms of the reason why perhaps the partnership um, for this particular research was not extended to other groups. And I also wanted to know, are there any plans to expand dialogue such as this to be a little bit more broad and inclusive of groups such as the National Panhellenic Council or the National Organization of Latina 
Latino um, fraternal organizations? No, that's a great question. I mean, I'll, I'll just ample, uh, answer very simply from Galba's perspective. Um, we uh, are approached uh, by numbers of different groups on different topics uh, for different studies, and uh, this one you just happened to be one where uh, the leadership of NPC and NIC uh, reached out to us knowing about the, the broader national study that was being conducted, wanting to know very specifically about that. So, um, so it was as simple as that, but I think your question of um, you know, broadening that uh, framework would be very valuable. And what we're learning uh, is that this, as, as everybody has stated on the panel, this co-curricular experience, these elements of care and mentorship in all of our experiences, whether we're talking about college or the workplace, uh, increasingly uh, are becoming evident that they matter a lot. And so as we think about all the other ways that we can boost the probability that somebody experiences these things, I think that's uh, pretty critical. So uh, it would be terrific to, you know, to think about how uh, to the, the other questions that were raised and broadening the scope of the study. Um, those are all things that we would certainly be eager to do in the future. So um, yeah, but maybe you guys comment too on that. Brandon, correct me if I'm wrong, but the question worded was inclusive of all national organizations. So membership in an MPHC, NALFO, NAPA, in, um, NIC or NPC organization was all inclusive. So participants from these organizations likely were in the study. In terms of the, um, the resources that are required to participate in this, NIC and NPC have the means. And so we viewed it as our opportunity to advance the collective whole and that we work on behalf of all fraternal organizations. And therefore, because um, we have the means, we should do this. And so um, it, it's important to us that, that this be seen as advancing the whole of fraternal organizations, not just NIC and NPC groups. And I, I should have clarified, thank you, Pete. The, the way the question was worded was broadly around membership in a fraternity or sorority. So it was in not specifically listed by uh, members of NIC or NPC yeah. exclusively. So, um, and if we, you know, if we look at the, uh, the demographics of the respondents and, and some of the other elements, I'm sure we'd see that play out. So we can follow up on that too. But yes, another question? Just to follow up on something you just said, so said specifically national, right? Correct. Okay, so yeah. it probably had, it's likely to say that NPHC members, but potentially not some of our multicultural organizations that are considered more regional or do you think that it was it could be interpreted that anybody who was in a fraternity and sorority probably would have responded because that was the question I was curious about was that could we pull it out was there a way to show that yeah I think the, the you know the more, more follow-up on that would certainly be helpful but I think um, it's probably the case that not many people uh, as respondents would distinguish in such a nuanced okay. way if they're asked the question were you a member of a mm -hmm. national fraternity or sorority um, you know, I think they probably are broadly responding to that fraternity or sorority experience. We did note uh, that we weren't asking about a national honor society right. or, or things like that. So we were trying to be specific in the question about uh, fraternity and sorority the way that we've thought about it in this context. But, you know, to, to expand this, you'd have to drill down into them selecting uh, from a list of uh, those known right. entities out there. So it's possible to do that, but it just makes the complexity of the of the survey and the study a little higher. But that's what we did in identifying respondents from where they graduated. You know, we had the IPEDS list of all the known institutions of higher education, uh, and that's how we uh, identified those who are graduates of a particular institution. So um, the short of it is, it is possible to get to a much more nuanced element of that. Uh, but for this particular uh, study this year, um, it was just the, the broader definition, so. And just one last piece of that. Did you separate it out by sorority member and fraternity member? Because I'd be curious if the data was different. Yeah, for the purpose of this analysis, it's just uh, those who are uh, fraternity or sorority members as a whole. We didn't break it down by male, female, but um, certainly you could do that. I mean, with the uh, little over 5,000 respondents, we had uh, a really good data set to work with. So that's possible to do, but for this analysis, we just looked at those who oh, had wow. the experience without breaking down by male or female to look at sorority or fraternity. Great, thank you. Yep. And I'm curious, we've talked about a couple things that this is a following question I have. The, um, 
this idea of mentorship, right? I mean, so so it's it's positive news that fraternity and sorority members are are more likely to have experienced that. Um, but obviously, it could be a lot higher, right? None of us are none of us are happy, I think, with where that's at. And this seems to be a common theme across higher ed. It's a challenge across K twelve, right? Everybody um, is trying to figure out how we boost opportunities for internships and jobs for young people, right? Even if they're unpaid. Um, everybody's trying to figure out how we get more people to the table to serve as mentors. And so I, I wonder how we can get to a place where that happens in uh, much more impressive numbers, right? So you, you both talked about the value of the alumni base, getting them more involved. You know, Kevin even, you know, highlighted that. Um, you know, it, it just seems that we have an opportunity as a country right now to encourage mentorship in new ways. And I've, I've joked about this, but I'm curious how you guys would, would uh, run with this from a fraternal and sorority perspective. But, you know, we have this mandate in our country called jury duty, <laughs> right? And we, we all believe it's important enough that, that it's required, right? And we have a process for determining who actually gets to sit as a juror. So it's not like 100% end up being one. But I joked one time in a speech that we should, we should have required mentor duty in this country. Mm. And, and I kind of laughed at it at first. And then when I thought about it more seriously, I thought, no, 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 I, I, I would actually push for something like that. I, I'm curious, I know it sounds like a crazy idea, but in, in general, how do we get to a place where we increase greatly, not just by a few percentage points, the probability that students have mentoring relationships? Because from this national data, less than a third of college right. graduates say they had a mentor who encouraged their hopes and dreams, right? That, that's not the dropouts, that's not high school grads, that's a third of college graduates who are saying that. So two thirds are missing it. So I'm just curious to, to, to be provocative in your thinking, how can we dramatically drive those numbers? What, what could fraternities and sororities do in partnership with organizations like NASPA, Kevin, or even thinking about breaking through this paradigm of curricular versus co-curricular? as if these are two separate worlds right. between student affairs and academic affairs. Mm -hmm. I would just love for you guys to kind of talk about that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. I think there's opportunities here, but mm -hmm. I'm curious what you think. Well, I'll start and, and, not, and not necessarily answer your question about fraternities and sororities, because I think what you've, I think that's a piece of it. I think what you've, what your research in, last, in the last go around uh, reinforces is um, too few students have not just a mentor experience, but that kind of deep, engaged, connected experience that we know makes a difference. Because I don't think it makes, I mean, while the data supports, and I'm, I don't want to take away from the, the, the really good news here, but I, but I think that um, whether you're working in a lab with a faculty member, or you're the president of, a, of an organization, you're in Greek life, whether you're in, uh, in a residence hall working, you know, have an interaction with a resident assistant, and a resident, that kind of, connect, we know it makes a difference, but it happens to too few students. And I think that's what I keep, you know, not to get, you know, you want the glass is half full, but it's also half empty, it's a third empty actually. And that in terms of, we're not doing, we're as, in, as institutions and uh, college universities are not doing enough to reach out to students who for some reason don't in their own make that connection. And I think that that's part of our failure. Um, if you join a fraternity or sorority, if you get involved in that lab experiment, if you join a student organization, you, those are, those are um, activities that co force you to do something. You've taken initiative to do something. You've taken that action. I think where our, our failure is, is the students who, are, who don't either have the confidence, the identity development, the, whatever, the, the skill set, um, to or, or see the value in that kind of engagement and connection. We've got to do more with those students. We need to get, do more with that. So some of it's providing the how many mentors you might have, but I also think it's how we change the expectations that students have when they enter college about what the college experience is like. Yes, it's a coming of age experience, but you, but, and I like Annie Chen from Wake Forest, who's the big in the Career Center area, and he, if you watch his TED talk, he basically talks about College is a job. Right. It's a you know it's a privilege and it's a job. It's not it's not it, these aren't gap years. Right. These are these are years that you have to spend actively engaged in your own education. And frankly, I think we need to do more about uh, reinforcing that philosophy uh, than just providing more opportunities. I think the opportunities are there, uh, Brandon. Um, I think there's lots of untapped opportunities. I don't know. I think we need we may need more mentors, but I think we need more 
uh, sort of get help, helping our students get more driven and achievement oriented about what they're there for. I agree. That's just a little riff on that. I, I totally agree with all your comments, Kevin. I think they're spot on. I, you know, I'm sitting here and I'm thinking to myself, how can we outline the expectations early on to mm -hmm. college students entering um, our ranks and tell them, you know, if you want to be a passive learner, then just do this. If you want to enrich your experience, do this. Mm -hmm. and, and help identify ways that they truly can graduate with not just a degree, but with experiences that will transfer to the workplace and into their communities in meaningful ways. And so, um, you know, maybe it's being that direct. If you, if you just want this, this is the minimalist um, expectation, but if you want this, these are ways that you can enrich mm -hmm. the experience. Yeah, and I, I worry about this because um, we have had the luxury the last two decades of largely educating um, a, a significant portion of our students are, um, are not first generation, they're not low income students. Um, and if you look at the data about where we're heading, mm -hmm. and you all have heard me speak about this, mm -hmm. and everybody's speaking about it, that, that, that in 10 years our colleges will look very different. So if we're not doing a very good job already with the right. students who maybe have, what are we, how is that going to work for the students who have um, no understanding of what college, the parents didn't go to college, they're probably working 20 hours a week more because they're, low, they're in a low income situation. How are we going to get at this, this intangible thing that has been difficult already with um, a, mu a much more challenging population uh, in terms of their, what, they, what, what they bring to college, you know, their knowledge of college. So I, th I think that uh, we have a lot of work to do in terms of how we're going to evolve as higher education institutions as, our, as the and, demographics change. And it really gives fraternities and sororities the opportunity to be, be that bridge Absolutely. for higher education. Absolutely. And that's yeah. why we need to step forward into that with some sound research, with some good practice, and with um, a genuine partnership. You know, Brandon, your idea of mandated mentorship, yeah, I, I think about that a lot um, as I am connected to thousands of undergraduates, um, but I'm more drawn to that question as a parent. And the idea of success being connected to finding someone who cares about you is really an important thing to me as dad and as professional. And we don't spend enough time in those meaningful one-on-one -on -one relationships where we truly know who this person is that we're talking to and have a sense for what this, what this child needs. And nine times out of a 10, it comes back to this idea that someone cares about me, who is invested in me. And I think that that idea of mentorship can be redefined because all of us can be mentors whether we have signed up for it or not. And it is creating opportunities to connect people in need. And what better way to do that via the intergenerational connection of fraternities and sororities? It's not just about going back to campus to relive memories. It's about going back to campus to reconnect with the next generation. And if we are purposefully connected to the Career Center, if fraternities and sororities are directly connected to the alumni office, and we have established those connections, imagine the momentum that is built as a result of that. And you know, I t uh, it is always part of, of my remarks of a better fraternity sorority person means a better mom or dad. It means a, a more engaged, active community advocate. It means a better career-centered person. And that's what mentorship is, is showing it, living it, living a values-based life that is connected right back to the values of your fraternity and sorority. And that's what we teach via our, our undergraduate education. And, and that's, that is really the basis for the establishment of the commissions. I can't imagine that the commissions are going to come back and say um, fraternities and sororities should do less. The commissions are going to come back and say we should do more in this area for a greater impact. And I'm looking forward to those results. 
and I am very excited about what the implementation phase of that looks like. It's going to change. And what will fraternity and sorority look like for the next generation? I'm excited. Yeah, I appreciate your comments. You, you were just kind of talking about the idea of mentoring changing and, and the notion being that I used to be involved in the Big Brothers Big Sister program in Boston. And there were 1,400 kids at any given point in time that were waiting for a match yeah. to a big brother. And the biggest challenge in recruiting people to that was that there were guys who had the time, they were willing, but they didn't think they were able because they thought that they had to have some special training to be mm -hmm. a mentor, mm -hmm. right? Like, well, I'm not, I'm not trained to do that. I don't know how I would do that, right? And where, 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 where you're talking about is you know, changing the essence of that. Just half the battle is just showing up in those situations. I wasn't trained to be a mentor. I didn't know what that, but just showing up and spending time and showing somebody that you care about them mm -hmm. may be uh, one of the key ingredients. So I, I love your framing of that. And I think that all of mm -hmm. us can, can do a better job of it. So. Um, let me do this. Uh, let me ask if there's any other uh, remaining questions from the audience. We've got time for one more, and then uh, we'll break and allow everybody a chance to, uh, if you haven't already met one another, uh, to do so and uh, have some conversation offline. Any other questions from anybody here? Yes. Good morning. Uh, my name is Leah McConnell. I'm the Assistant Director of Marketing and Communications for Tri Sigma. And my question for the panel is, so I think one common theme that you both or all of you had actually said is this is something that provides proof in what we're already teaching our members and the community, but are there any particular goals or ideas that you want us as um, Greek organization staff to do with sharing this information? I think obviously in recruitment this could be good, but is there anything else that you want us to do with this information to share with our members or the community that we're involved with? Well, obviously, we're thrilled uh, with the findings. As I've said earlier, uh, while we're excited that these point favorably uh, to elements of well-being, we still have work to do. Um, and we will and can leverage some of these strengths. Um, with regard to rolling out this information and sharing it, um, I know there's plans to not only share it with MPC groups, uh, I'm speaking for MPC, and I know NIC has plans too to roll this out to its member groups. Also to share with our interfraternal brothers and sisters, uh, because everybody stands to benefit from these findings and the indicators. Um, Past that, we are also uh, going to uh, share these findings with our uh, colleagues in higher ed, uh, push this out to campuses so that they too can use these as proof points um, when they're questioned about the benefit of sororities or fraternities on campuses. So it will be an ongoing, a very deliberate uh, type of uh, rollout of the findings with regard to what else to do with it. Um, interestingly, uh, this weekend, um, the MPC will be meeting in Chicago. Our board of directors will be meeting. I know that this will be a hot topic and we'll start dialoguing about, okay, so now what do we do with this and, and what are some new goals that we can set for ourselves? Um, we're all high achievers, and uh, while the percentages are in our favor, um, I think those of us uh, that have been in the business for a while would like to see it even higher. Um, and so the dialogue will continue on what can we be doing to contribute to the good health and the physical aspect of this um, for our women, since that is a charge as part of our MPC creed for Guardian of Good Health. What else can we be doing um, to uh, embrace this notion of community involvement? And what else should we be doing to discuss purpose and, and um, the other elements too that are listed? So I think this is just the beginning of many conversations that are gonna be happening around the table. Two ideas. One internal, one external. Taking the lead from Brandon with his provocative mandated mentorship, I have often dreamed about what if the undergraduate experience was all new member and that you didn't actually get initiated until you graduated. 
because much like our partners in MPHC, the alumni experience is where fraternity is in action. This is all learning. This is living. And so I would like to see us as a collective group focus on the lifelong learning part. How do we better engage our alumni directly? How do we provide resources and support to them as they change careers midlife? How do we do a better job of connecting them to the resources and support systems available as life transitions happen? How are we fulfilling the promise of fraternity and sorority? So that's one aspect. But I think that, it, that our connection to higher education um, and the idea that the co-curricular experience positively impacts the lifelong learning of our students puts us at the forefront of um, making purposeful relationships within the collegiate experience to advance each student's learning, each student's um, potential success. And so if we can do a better job of articulating for our higher education partners, here is what the fraternity sorority experience is, is intended to be. Here are the resources and support that we bring to the table. Here are the needs that we have in, in collaboration with you. And together, here is the promise that we can make for today's student. I think that that's where our, um, our success will be measured. Kevin, you want to have the final word? No. Oh, <laughs> I set you up perfectly oh. for that one. And you got to follow up. Now, now, now you'll take now it. Now I'll take the final word, yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I, yeah, I think that, um, you know, what I, I hope this does is, is um, uh, sort of ad adjust the narrative a little bit about what, about what the college experience is like in both ways, and bo both the, speaks to the power that we know exists about um, the co-curricular experiences that students engage in, um, as well as the academic experiences. And Brandon, I just want to follow up on something you said, which I completely agree with. I, I hate academic student affairs conversations because students don't experience the college university that way. They go to college. It's mm -hmm. holistic for them. It's one experience. So this, this barrier, the wheat kind of artificial barrier, I think is, um, is kind of, kind of silly. But I think, I, 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 would, I hope it changes that narrative a little bit. But I also hope it motivates us to think about um, the students who are not being not getting this experience. I mean, I think that's the biggest takeaway. If I was a college president and I saw this data or the data you released two weeks ago, I would feel very bad about what's happening on my campus. And I assume that many college presidents are. Because um, um, at this price point and at what we're trying to develop, if, 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 this, if only this percentage of students are getting this experience, I, I think that, pro that, should, that should really force us to be thinking about how we engage these students who are not, for some reason, connecting in whatever the experience is, whether it be Greek life, student acti activities, um, athletics, uh, labs, music, athletics, honors, intramural sports yeah. and recreations, you, you name it. You know, why, what's going on in our campus is not allowing that more, more full engagement um, with, the, with the collegiate experience, given that it has such a positive outcome. So that, that's my biggest takeaway. Yeah, I, I think that's great. Well, um, I want to thank Pete and Gene again for uh, helping make this research possible. Kevin, for your participation thank in the you. panel and for your ongoing work making sure this uh, happens across higher ed. And uh, thank, uh, thanks to all of you for, for coming this morning. We'll go ahead and adjourn and uh, leave some time for everybody to uh, connect and show one another that you care. <laughs> thanks very much. Appreciate you being here.